let's all stand as we sing what a mighty God we, we serve. He has made me glad and this is the day. <clears throat>
our next song is going to be At the Cross. Jesus is mine. Oh, 
the way, we will be starting our series through the book of Revelation next Sunday. Since this is the first Sunday of the new year, I wanted to have just a special new year message about uh, the starting place to find God's will for your life. And uh, I, I think Isaiah chapter 6 describes that for us. So let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Isaiah chapter 6. The, the prophet Isaiah, <clears throat> under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning. I pray that you would give me the words to say to your people this morning and that you would draw us closer to you through this passage and that you would help us to understand what it means to, to truly be changed by being in your presence. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Have you ever uh, gotten lost uh, you know, and you, you need to stop and ask for directions. By the way, do you know why the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? Because even then, men wouldn't stop and ask for directions. Yeah. It, uh, but you ever stop and ask for directions and somebody, you know, stop at some country gas station, some guy's chewing on tobacco or something, you know, got a toothpick sticking out of his mouth. And, well, how do I get to such and such place? And what does he say? You can't get there from here, Right. And so 2020 has been a rough year on a lot of people. Can, can, can I get some agreement on that? Yeah. Right? And, and so you may feel down and out. You may feel like things are, are it's time to despair. Isaiah here, he's, you know, the death of a very much loved king has a, a, occurred. A king that had reigned for 52 years on the throne of Judah. And... Things are, are beginning to look bad. The, the Assyrian Empire is, is on the rise and they're beginning to be a threat to God's people. And, and so in the midst of that, uh, he, he is beginning to despair. And, and let me tell you, that is not a good place to start from if you want to uh, begin to serve God, if you want to find out His will. You know where you need to start is where Isaiah started. He, he went to the temple. Now when I say go to the temple, I'm not talking about just come into church. I'm talking about 
maybe getting alone in your prayer closet and, and seeking God and, and understanding, you know, be, be trying to get into His presence through His Word. That, that's how we have access to His presence. And if you want to know God's will for your life, all I'm going to give you today is the starting place, okay? So don't expect that you'll go out of here knowing exactly God wants me to do such and such and such. I, I'm giving you how to get to the starting point. So, so you can't get there from a point of despair. You've got to go somewhere else first. And, and Isaiah 6 gives us a road map to get to where we need to go to get started. Okay? So, and, and so what we find out when we get to Isaiah 6 is that Christians must grasp God's holiness, experience His grace, and surrender to His will in order to rightly serve Him. So there's three elements in this passage that I want to uh, point out as sort of like the foundational elements of, of beginning to discover God's will for your life. Uh, the first thing that we see is that we need an authentic revelation of the holiness of God. Here, here in verses uh, 1 through 4, uh, Isaiah, he, he comes into the temple and all of a sudden he's, he's transported into the heavenly temple. Now, this is most likely a vision. It's not that he was literally transported into heaven, but this is a, a vision that God has, has given him. And uh, But here's the thing. You need to understand who God is before you can rightly serve him. You, you really do need to understand who God is. There, there, you've got to know what God is like. Because if you don't know what God is like, it won't be long until you'll get tired of serving Him. And, and Isaiah here, he first thing he notices is, is that he sees His exaltation and His majesty. Uh, he, he's enthroned in power. He says, in the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. God is enthroned in power. That throne represents uh it symbolizes authority and rule and power. God on His throne is not like earthly kings. You know, something bad happens, we throw out that cliche saying that, well, God's still on His throne. But that may be cliche, but it's true. God is on His throne. And in contrast to earthly kings, I mean, think about this. Isaiah has, has, has witnessed the end of the life of a beloved king who had who had reigned for 52 years. I got to figuring that out. Do you know who was inaugurated? You know, this is January, the month we inaugurate presidents. Do you know who was inaugurated into office 52 years ago? As of January 20th, later this month, Richard Nixon was inaugurated into office on January 20th, 1969. That, that was 52 years ago. Imagine having Richard Nixon as our president for the last 52 years. I, I won't get into the politics and stuff, but just imagine having the same president of the United States for 52 years and it being a good president. And, and all of a sudden he's gone. And, and, and you're in despair and, and all of these things that, are, are, you know, are, are coming up. And, and, and we know that human rule and, and authority is it just it doesn't last. That's why we have Queen Elizabeth II, Henry VIII, you know, Louis the Fourteenth. But guess what? We're still on God the First. There, there will never be another God on the throne. He, he is on His throne. He is enthroned in His power. And, and Isaiah needed to see that. Uh, but he is also clothed in majesty. Notice that it says that he, his, his, the train of his robe was filling the temple. You know, in, in the ancient Middle East, where, you know, the size of your train, if you were a ruler, represented how, how powerful and how majestic you really were. And, and when we say the train, we typically think of like the long flowing train of like a bridesmaid. The, the word here actually just means the hem. The hem of his garment actually just the whole filled the whole temple. He, he is so majestic. Just, just the hem of his garment filled the temple. He, he, he's an important ruler. 
Is he important enough to you to, to at least inconvenience your life, to, to serve him and, and to take him seriously? He, he is important. He's, he's clothed in majesty. Then we need to see in verses 2 and 3 his holiness and his glory. Well, we, we've got to know what holiness is, first of all. And, and I'm trying, and what I'm going to try to do is explain something that's really unexplainable by, by talking about his holiness. What, what is holiness? You, you need to know what holiness is. Well, holiness, or to be holy, means to be set apart or separated. It's, it's distinctive, it's different, it's transcendent. Uh, it, it, it's to be entirely different than everything else. Now, that, that's where God is distinctive. He, it, that, that is, if you think about that, that is the main thing that defines God is His holiness. Why aren't the, the seraphims shouting love, love, love? Because what does the Bible say God is? God is love. But that is not the attribute that really defines God's character. It's holiness. In, in other words... All of these other attributes like love, when we see this passage, we realize that God's love is a holy love. Amen. When, when we see that God has wrath, we, we, we realize that it's a holy wrath. It's, it's righteous and it's just and it's pure. So we need to understand that. I mean, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11 says, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You know, how many of you ever been uh, confronted with the argument from, from an atheist trying to get you to disbelieve God? To say, well, well you Christians, you're atheists too. And, I, and you, know, you say, what do you mean? They say, well, do you believe in Zeus or, or Thor or, or those gods? And you say, well, no. And they say, well, I'm, I'm just an atheist in regard to one more God than you are. And so, and, and supposedly that's clever. And, and Christians don't, you know, they're kind of caught off guard and don't have a good comeback for that. But here's, here's the thing. Our God is different. As Exodus 15, 11 says, he's different from all those other gods. You, you take Zeus, for ex example. Uh, Zeus, you know, he sort of arose from this like primordial soup that gave rise to his his parents, and and you know, and then he ended up being powerful enough to take over. And supposedly, he he's a physical person, he's a physical god, and he stands on Mount Olympus. And every time it thunders, it's actually Zeus throwing lightning bolts down off Mount Olympus. And so, what what that is is that's a god of the gaps. In other words, well, we, we can explain how lightning works so we don't need Zeus anymore. It doesn't work that way with the Christian God. It, you know, if, if you were to come in here this morning, or, or let's say you come in here some Sunday morning, and Edwin and I are back there in the fellowship hall and there's coffee brewing, and, and you ask, how come there's coffee there on the on the coffee maker and I tell you well the cop you put the water in the coffee machine and you, you heat it up and the heat excites the water molecules and they get agitated and get further apart and increase in temperature and then it runs through the coffee grounds and the, the heated water pulls off the the coffee liquid from the coffee grounds and it takes it into the the cup into the pot there and that's my explanation for why there's, it's the scientific explanation for why there's coffee in the coffee pot. And Edwin says, I don't know what he's talking about. There's coffee in that coffee pot because I wanted coffee. <laughs> well, well does, does one explanation cancel out the other? No. They're, they're both valid explanations. And, and you see... The difference between our God and, and a God like Zeus is that our God actually created all of this world. Amen. And, and when we see lightning, 
we know that God created a process in which lightning can come about naturally in the world. And there's a reason why modern science was birthed in, Christian, in Christianity. It's because those, those first scientists thought, well, if I can understand how nature works, then I'm looking into the mind of God to see how He makes things work. That's not a God of the gaps. Okay, I'm off of my tangent now. Uh, that rabbit has been chased down, but I get so aggravated sometimes when, when you just, you know, they, they, they tell us, here's conventional wisdom if you're a preacher, is that you don't use churchy words, you know, because the modern people don't understand words like propitiation, which is found in Romans chapter 3. And, and, and here's the problem is if we keep doing, we've done that so much that people don't even know what we mean when we say God. And so what we need to do is go ahead and use those words, but explain them so that people can understand. Okay, that was rabbit number two. So we need to understand what holiness is. It's what sets God apart from all these other gods, from everything. He separates him from you and me. It separates him from these seraphim. I mean, these seraphim, that, the word seraphim means a burning one. They, 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 these are angels that look like they're on fire. Okay, and, and, and so the, the little cute pictures of angels that you, you probably have in your house, that, that's not an accurate depiction, okay? It, it, they're, they're described as burning ones, and they're, they're quite scary, to be honest. Um, and he, we know what holiness is, but we, we see from the seraphim what holiness requires. They, they're covering their face in humility. They're covering their, their feet in reverence. They're, and they're flying with two wings, the other two wings, ready to, at a moment's notice to serve God, to, to do His bidding. That's what holiness requires. But then we need to comprehend the incomprehensible level of God's holiness. You see, here, here's where I'm sort of a beggar for words when it comes to trying to explain God's holiness. What we have here in the Old Testament is something that we have nowhere else in the Old Testament. And that's called a super superlative, where these angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. The, the closest thing, see, see, if you really want to emphasize something in Hebrew, you don't say like good and better, you just repeat the word. And so like in, in the book of Kings, would you want to ex express that, some, that gold is pure gold? The Bible says gold, gold. To let you know that it's, it's, it's not just gold, it's gold, gold, right? It, it's pure gold. And so that, that happens every so often in the Hebrew Bible. You'll get a, a word repeated like that to stress how it is. But if you really want to say that this is the top of the line, of holiness and there is no thing else even close to being as holy you say it three times holy 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 I mean God's holiness is so far beyond anything that we can imagine and it changes Isaiah's life from here on out he calls God the Holy One of Israel God's holiness is I mean these seraphim, they're, they're sinless, right? So they're holy. But, the, I mean, a caterpillar is closer to the seraphim than God is when it comes to holiness. He is so far beyond that. And that's why we need this experience of His holiness. And, and we find out, too, in, in verse uh, 4, or verse 3, that the whole earth... His glory will fill the whole earth. That it says there in my Bible, the earth is full of His glory. But the problem is, is that the, the Hebrew does not give us a verb there. It's supplied by the translators. So it could be that the earth is full of His glory, but it could be that the earth will be full of His glory. And we, we see in Psalm 72, verse 19, where it says, And blessed be his glorious name forever. And may the whole earth be filled with his glory. According to Psalm, it's something that we're looking for. 
something that is yet to come, that the earth will be filled with his glory. Well, we see what that looks like when we get to Revelation 22, verse 5. It says, And there will, be, there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of a light of a lamp nor light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. There's coming a day when the glory of the Lord is going to provide all the light that we need. And there will never be another night. His glory is going to feel that. Then we need to see His power and His presence. Verse 4 says, The foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. You, we, we sang earlier, I will enter His courts with thanksgiving in my heart and enter His courts with, with praise. And that is biblical. But that's not how you enter the first time you come into His presence. That you, you need to come into His presence the scary way the first time. And what I mean by the scary way. You know, if you've ever seen uh, or, or read the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or seen the movie, you know that Susan, one of the children, she uh, is getting ready to meet Aslan. And, you know, these books... These children's books of Narnia, they're, they're allegories of Christianity. Aslan represents Jesus in this story. And Aslan is a lion. And, and Mr. Beaver is telling Susan about Aslan. And uh, he says, Aslan is a lion. The, lo the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king, I tell you. See, it's not safe to meet God, even though God is good. God is, he, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's not a tame lion, as, as as it says, as, as Susan said in that book, Isaiah finds that out. You ever, now, I grew up in Kentucky where we have a lot more tornadoes than we do here. You guys get a lot more lightning. We, get, we just get tornadoes, okay? And you, you never, you ever had some situation where you feel like you've gotten accidentally gotten too close to something dangerous, like a tornado or something like that. I, I remember when I was probably in middle school, you know, we were allowed to walk to school and back and stuff with no problem in those days. I uh, didn't have to worry about being kidnapped so much. Um, but I took a, a shortcut down this street to school and a neighbor's Rottweiler came out to the edge of the yard and just started growling at me. That may be the most afraid I've ever been in my life. Because I thought, I've, I've gotten too close. I can't get away. There's, there's nothing I can do to get away from this dog. Thankfully, all it did was growl and just let me go on by. But that, that's where Isaiah finds himself here is that he, he, he's gotten this authentic revelation of God's holiness and it's come at the cost of him getting too close to God in a sinful state. And so what he needs and what you need, if you want the second element for finding the starting place, for, for going with God, is, is an atoning experience of the grace of God. And the first thing you need to do is just to feel the anguish of your sin. He says here in verse 5, then said, I woe is me. For I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> you know what's ironic about this is most of the time we come to this and we just preach Isaiah 6. But what we don't realize, Isaiah was already a prophet and a preacher. And in chapter 5, he was telling the people, woe you and woe you and woe you. And, and, and woe you, you've done this. And woe you, you've done that. And when he gets to chapter 6 and he sees God, what's, what's his response? Uh-oh. Woe is me. 
He sees his own sinfulness. And, and he realizes there, there's nothing I can do. I've already gotten into God's presence. And, and I'm, I'm done for. I, I'm, I'm a goner. And that's when he confesses his sin. And he says that he's a man of unclean lips. Isn't that an odd confession? It's typical we don't think about what comes out of our mouth being that bad, right? I mean, it, I'm, I'm a good person. I just, I just say some bad things every now and then. Well, I, and I'm not going to read the passage to you. I've given you Luke chapter 6. But basically what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, those verses, if you want to read them, uh, 43 through 45, is that what comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. And so if you have a potty mouth, Jesus says you have a potty heart. Okay? And, and, and it's not just bad words. You know, I, I realized that the other day as I was reading this that I have been all just about all this past year attributing causal power to an inanimate year on a calendar. 2020 did this. 2020 did that. All year long. This is what 2020 has done. 20, you know, 2020 can't do a thing. It's just an inanimate... It, it, you say, well, that's not that bad. Folks, that's, that's near to blasphemy. Attributing something that God does to, some, to, to an inanimate calendar year? <laughs> Woe is me. You've got to come here to, to find this place, this place of confession. And then you can receive the atoning sacrifice. It's interesting here because in John chapter 12 and verse 41, we find out something about what Isaiah saw in this vision. It says these things Isaiah saw because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's the him that John is talking about? Jesus. Isaiah is actually seeing Jesus on the throne. Not just God the Father, he's seeing Jesus is what Isaiah says. Or what John says in his gospel. You know when, when the priests went into the Holy of Holies each year on the Day of Atonement, they took a a, a, a censer full of hot coals and put them on the altar where the sacrifice was made. And that what is represented here is, is that this, this angel, this seraphim, is taking this burning coal from the altar where the sacrifice is made and, and meeting Isaiah at his point of need, at, at where his confession is on his lips. But, but it, it's not just his lips that are cleansed. It's, it's his entire, it says, it, it uses the word iniquity, and iniquity refers to inner wickedness. It, it cleansed the whole person, cleansed all of Isaiah. And so he, he's cleansed, and he's ready to serve the Lord. And folks, before you can truly serve God, you've got to see God as he really is, and then you've got to have this experience of God's grace. It's, a, it's, it's only then that you can enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart and enter his courts with praise. Look at how Isaiah has changed. Because here's the third element. An absolute surrender to the will of God. And, and what Isaiah does here is, is he surrenders even before God tells him what he wants. Right? He, he, he says... Uh, then I heard, of, verse 8, then I heard the voice from the throne saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Now if I hear Marty say, Who's going to go for me? What am I going to ask? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I've got to find out the details before I'm willing to surrender, right? Right? That's not how Romans chapter 12 tells us 
that he says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we get this purpose clause. Why, why am I going to set, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and give God a blank check with my life. And say, Lord, whatever it is. And he says, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, God says, surrender to me, and then I'll tell you what my will is. Just go ahead and surrender. Write, God, that, that blank check with your life. God, if, if you want all of it, just, just write the check. And he will do that, by the way. But then you surrender, knowing most people will harden their hearts toward Jesus. He says in verses 9 and 10, he said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. You know, it, it's discouraging. Proclaiming the, the message of salvation, knowing that most people are going to reject it. You've, you've got to have a thick skin if you're going to serve God. You've got to be willing to, to face some rejection. Because it, it's going to happen. That, that's what's happening here. There, and it's just like, you know, if you put clay in heat, what does it do? It gets hard. If you put wax in heat, what happens? It melts. Same thing, and, and that's what happens with the gospel. You, you proclaim the gospel, some people will respond, some people won't. So you just keep proclaiming the gospel. So you surrender knowing that most people will harden their hearts toward Jesus, but then surrender knowing that it will be for your entire life. See, now, now when Isaiah's heard, now that Isaiah's heard what God wants him to do, now the question comes, how long? Verse 11. How long? And God tells him, until cities are devastated without inhabitant, houses are, you know, in other words, basically the rest of your life, Isaiah, and, and, and there'll be people proclaiming even after you're gone. Just keep on going. You know, for most of us, you know, I mentioned that it's the, that serving God and surrendering Him. It's, it's like writing that blank check and saying, "Here, Lord." And, and you, you, what you imagine when when I say that, and what I imagine when I say that, is that you know, someday somebody will come and. Uh, you know, some government official will come around and say, you, you either reject Jesus or, or we're going to take your life. And, and you, you just say, no, I, I'm not going to surrender. I'm, I'm not going to reject Jesus. I'm going to remain faithful. And then they take your life and you've written that, that check out with your entire life. But for most of us, what it means to, to give God like a blank check is, is that, we'll, we'll, you know, he wants $1.97 today. Tomorrow he wants $15. The next day, maybe two ninety five. Who knows? And, and, and daily life, it just seems like it can get in, into a, a grind and a and a monotony. But just here's the thing: is just to be faithful to God every single day and surrender to Him every single day and give Him your entire life, and then you can come to the place of knowing His will. Because he may just reveal it to you a day at a time. And that's okay. But then the good news is surrender knowing that some people will receive salvation through Jesus. Verse 13 is a very hopeful verse. It says, yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. What in the world is he talking about? Isaiah, most of the people 
are going to reject me. You keep on preaching anyway. But there's at least a tenth of them that will receive the message. But times are, are going to get rough. The, 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 David, the Davidic dynasty, it's going to be like a, 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 a terebinth or an oak tree that's been chopped down. But out of that chopped down oak tree, there's still life in that stump. And out of that stump, I'm going to bring a king who will reign forever. This holy seed from the stump. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the hope that we have. It is that God, even though he judged these people, he raised up his son to make that atoning sacrifice for us, to cleanse us from our sin and to give us eternal life and to welcome us into a brand new kingdom mm -hmm. under the reign of his son. We've got to be faithful to proclaim that message anyway. I like how 2 Corinthians puts it, verses 14 through 16. Paul says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? How many of you like the, the smell of rose petals? Yeah. They smell great, don't they? You know what they remind me of? Funerals. I, I, I can't help it. It's just, it, it may smell like a sweet fragrance of, of life to you, but, but to me it smells like death. Now I like roses, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, it's, it's just one of those things. <laughs> a, a little more contemporary illustration, I guess, is, you know, my, my mom used to be a, a, a beautician. And, and she and her sister had a salon in town and I'd go in there and it would smell like perm solution. Perm solution, I don't know if you smelled it in a while, but it smells awful, doesn't it? It smelled like money to me. <laughs> yeah. huh. I, I'm thinking old days, I don't know what it's like now. Oh, good, it's changed a lot. But when I was a kid, it smelled like <laughs> when I was a kid, it smelled like money, you know. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, had several cattle farmers in, in the in the church where I, I pastored before, and I'd be at their farm or something, smell that manure, you know, awful. Oh, that smells like money, you know. <laughs> Jesus is going to smell good some people and smell bad to others. How does he smell to you today? Do, do, you, do you see the sweet aroma being given off by, by the rose of Sharon having his, his petals crushed on the cross and giving that sweet aroma because it was death on that cross but it's an aroma of life for those who receive him. I want to offer you that today. If you're, if you're a Christian, you've been struggling with finding God's will, let me encourage you to just fall on your face at the foot of His throne. But if you've never received Him as Lord and Savior, you've got to come through this experience of seeing God as He really is because that's the only way you'll ever see your sin for what it really is. Thank you.